Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm the director of the New York Eye Cancer Center, professor of ophthalmology, and teach at multiple institutions around the New York City area and internationally. Today I would like to teach you about photographic imaging through ophthalmic oncology. Photographic imaging, in all its forms, has allowed me to be a better doctor and improve my outcomes. It is my hope this lecture will improve your quality of care. In this picture, you see me sitting with a patient explaining their eye tumor problem. As you see, photography is a foundational element for my eye cancer practice. Whether the tumor is on the eyelid, conjunctiva, iris, ciliary body, retina, choroid, or optic nerve, there is nothing more telling than imaging and comparative imaging. Sometimes it is comparing an older image versus a current image that makes all the difference. Other times, it's correlating the OCT, the fundus autofluorescent imaging, or an angiographic pattern with the color images. That is why at the New York Eye Cancer Center, we have 55-inch high-resolution screens in each examination room to enhance our examinations and to show patients aspects of their eye cancer. For example, there is nothing like seeing and showing the retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, to help explain the presence of radiation retinopathy or seeing a tumor regress as it responds to treatment. So let's talk about how we use photography. When using photography to define baseline tumor characteristics at the New York Eye Cancer Center, we include both the tumor and all apparently unaffected areas. That means taking a picture of the tumor and all quadrants when doing fundus photography. When we're doing slit lamp photography, it's taking a picture of the tumor and all the normal surfaces of the eye. Unlike clinical viewing, which requires patient cooperation, these photographs allow eye cancer specialists to view the tumor and its characteristics on HD screens for a relatively long period of time. They can be scrutinized and, and magnified. Photographs also document the condition of the tumor at that point in time. This allows comparisons for evidence of future growth, regression, or change. I recommend imaging all areas of the eye, eyelids, and fundus. Only then can the eye cancer specialist be sure that a new finding is actually novel. Once the tumor is treated, photographs are used to evaluate, measure, and thus document response. Side by side, before and after images are an invaluable tool to ascertain local cancer control and the appearance of side effects. All this can be done in front of the patients, allowing for both education and understanding plans for continued care. I believe you will find that patient education is the keystone to patient satisfaction. There exist many types of ophthalmic photography. From front to back, eye cancer specialists use cameras, slit lamp cameras, gonioscopic mirror-aided imaging, and fundus photography. We also inject intravenous dyes to enhance image contrast and to examine for physiologic differences between diseases. For example, fluorescein dye is typically used to differentiate retinal tumor vasculopathies, and when choroidal tumors affect the overlying retina and become visible. Indocyanine green allows for imaging of deeper choroidal vasculature, which in my opinion is much more boring than retinal, but still yields information about blocking of circulation in and around choroidal lesions. In contrast, or lack thereof, Optical coherence tomography, or OCT, is a scanning laser-based method of photography. Much like a CAT scan, it allows for sectioning and thus internal imaging of tissues anterior and posterior. Software-enhanced OCT imaging has allowed angiographic style imaging without the need for a contrast dye. That's called OCTA. Lastly, fundus autofluorescent imaging, 
is a photographic method to select specific wavelengths of light to reveal the presence of lipofuscin, a marker of cellular degradation. Before we move on to examining the use of photography for specific tumors, let's go over some basic concepts. Lighting affects pigmentation. This is a basic, important concept. This is true for all lighting and photography illumination as well. In general, the brighter the light, the smaller the pigmented area will look. It is important to try to reproduce or at least consider the background illumination when taking or reviewing patient photographs. The second foundational element is pigment blocks fluorescence. By definition, pigment blocks light and thus obscures what is beneath. The dominant intraocular pigment is the retinal pigment epithelium and the iris pigment epithelium called RPE and IPE respectively. However, it is the retinal pigment epithelium that allows fluorescein angiography by separating the retinal from the choroidal circulation and thus allowing visualization of interretinal microangiopathy. As the retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE, is the most important anatomic structure for retinal imaging, retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy is the best example of its effect. First, let's consider there are several types of retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy. The most common are secondary, then idiopathic, and rarely congenital. The secondary forms will come with a history or evidence of an etiologic agent, the idiopathic form can grow, exhibit melanolipofuscin, otherwise known as orange pigment, but does not metastasize. It is the congenital form that is called bear tracks. That is associated with the Gardner syndrome, also known as familial colonic polyposis. These patients should be co-managed with a gastroenterologist. Color photography is commonly used to initially document and then subsequently monitor retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy. Acquired lesions are typically circular or ovoid, but can be irregular in shape. The tumor edges are sharply demarcated and can exhibit a halo of exudative material. The surface is darkly pigmented, but can harbor areas of atrophy. Retinal vessels can be seen running over RPE lesions, while choroidal vessels can be visualized through the areas of atrophy. Here, we see three examples of acquired retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy. Note that all three exhibit sharply demarcated edges. The top left tumor shows a halo of exudative material surrounding the tumor. The lesion on the bottom shows areas of atrophy through which the choroidal vessels can be seen. Fluorescein angiography is a technique for examining the circulation of the retina and choroid. Using a fluorescent dye and a specialized camera, fluorescein is administered intravenously into the systemic circulation. The retina is illuminated with a blue light and a wavelength of 490 nanometers, which allows angiographic images to be obtained by photographing the fluorescent green light that is emitted by the dye. Now, as the retinal pigment epithelium covers the choroid, its pigment will block choroidal fluorescence and thus isolate the retinal circulation. The perfect example of this phenomenon is retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy. In that the RPE is thickened, these lesions appear as blackouts on fluorescein angiography. Conversely, when there are islands of RPE atrophy, imaging reveals the underlying choroidal circulation. I often hear doctors present this lesion as chirpy, or congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Do you think this was present at birth? No. Real chirpy looks like bear tracks, seen later in this tutorial. This lesion was acquired and should be called ARPE. A-R-P-E-H, or Acquired Retinal Pigment Epithelial Hypertrophy. On your left, note the early phase fluorescein angiogram 
of the dense pigment of this acquired RPE hypertrophy. It shows complete blocking of the choroidal circulation. However, the atrophic areas are window defects, which allow visualization of the early phase choroidal circulation. On the right, once time has passed, leakage from the choroidal vessels fill the ARPEH RPED defects, revealing diffuse hyperfluorescence. In this case, multiple smaller areas of atrophy are revealed to be hyperfluorescent. But note that the original and thickened hypertrophic RPE continues to block fluorescence through the duration of the study. Now that we understand how the RPE affects fluorescein imaging, let's apply our knowledge to the congenital form, CHIRPI, or grouped retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy, which contains increased melanin and larger melanosomes which block fluorescence. CHIRPI lesions do not leak, they do not grow, and are associated with familial adenomatous polyposis of the colon, also called Gardner's syndrome. On the left, you see a fundus photograph of congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, or CHIRPI. Note that the edges lack a halo. There are no areas of internal atrophy, and most importantly, they look like bear tracks. There is no retinal vascular leakage and no orange pigment lipofuscin. Fluorescein angiography reveals blockage of choroidal fluorescence that persists through the entire duration of the study. Here is another example of pigment blocks fluorescence. This is an RPE adenoma. Here you see very little increased fluorescence through the duration of the study. So let's move on to another pigmented intraocular tumor, melanocytoma. As I mentioned, they tend to be darkly pigmented, juxtapapillary, have feathered edges, and can be quite discohesive with vitreous cell. Though some can be brown and others can display orange pigment on their surface and others can undergo malignant transformation, there have been no reports of metastatic disease. Commonly associated with optic disc edema and vitreous seeds, the melanocytoma is a magnocellular nevus, a form of nevus. Here is another optic disc melanocytoma. Ophthalmoscopy and color imaging of the optic disc melanocytoma reveals a fork-like distribution within the choroid and overlying retina. Optic disc edema, as you see, is common. Thankfully, malignant transformation is rare and metastatic disease has not been reported. Here is an example of an optic disc melanocytoma with brown coloration. It also has evidence of C and V along its nasal margin. It also has hemorrhage below. These are rather atypical. But let's use those findings to contrast what's going on with the tumor. Here we see in the early phase angiogram that the melanocytoma blocks fluorescence. It just so happens to be associated with the choroidal neovascularization at its margin. As we see with this mid-phase angiogram, it does show some overlying interretinal leakage with increased hyperfluorescence, but these are retinal vessels. In contrast, the CNV is intensely hyperfluorescent at its margin. Here we have a very interesting case. This patient requested a nucleation for a symptomatic growing melanocytoma. He did not want to have a biopsy. He did not want to take any chances and wanted to have the eye removed. A clinical correlation between optical coherence tomography, histopathology, and color photography taught us that the tumor was growing into the adjacent choroid. While clumps of melanocytoma were found transiting through the overlying retina and even extending into the vitreous. In conclusion, the darkly pigmented melanocytoma typically involves the optic disc. It can cause disc edema, and its cells can migrate through the overlying retina into the vitreous. Melanocytomas can exhibit choroidal invasion. Fluorescein angiography is blocked by the pigment, 
but an edematous optic nerve will hyperfluoresce. In the last section, we learned that the retinal pigment epithelium shades the choroidal circulation, allowing fluorescein angiography, visualization of the retinal microvasculature and interretinal microangiopathy. Now let's examine a tumor that can present on top of, within, or beneath the retinal pigment epithelium, retinoblastoma. These tumors are typically white to gray and therefore non-pigmented, so they don't have any intrinsic pigmentation to block fluorescence. When bare tumor extends into the vitreous, it's called endophytic. When it extends beneath the retina, it is called exophytic. In practice, we often see combinations of both. Retinoblastomas can be unifocal, multifocal, and bilateral. Here we have a color photograph of an endophytic retinoblastoma. However, close observation reveals both intrinsic tumor blood vessels and overlying retinal vasculature. It is an amelanotic tumor and not covered by the retinal pigment epithelium. Note the endophytic retinoblastoma tumor on the left and the early phase fluorescein angiogram on your right. As the tumor grew anterior to the retinal pigment epithelium, its blood vessels are not covered by the RPE. Thus, the early phase angiogram reveals the tumor blood vessels and the overlying retinal vasculature. In the mid-phase fluorescein angiogram, we see the tumor vessels start to be obscured by interstitial leakage of dye. On the right, the late phase is characterized by a light bulb-like appearance with no discernible tumor blood vessels. Note that the fluorescein can be seen to leak into the overlying vitreous. In summary, endophytic retinoblastomas extend into the vitreous and are not covered or obscured by the retinal pigment epithelium. Therefore, in the early phases of the angiogram, they will demonstrate the tumor's blood vessels and overlying retinal vasculature. This is called a double circulation. However, late phases of the angiogram are likely to reveal a diffuse glow due to interstitial leakage, even into the vitreous. Clearly, the early phases of the angiogram are the most important. In contrast, exophytic rests of retinoblastoma will be covered by the retinal pigment epithelium. Thus, there is no chance to view the tumor circulation. Instead, we will see diffuse hyperfluorescence above the tumor as well as, in a less degree, from its associated serous retinal detachment. However, somewhat dependent upon where you practice, and thus the timing of diagnosis, most retinoblastomas present with both endophytic and exophytic growth patterns, as well as vitreous seeds. Small isolated tumors that are amenable to fluorescein angiography are more commonly seen in countries with well-developed medical systems where patients are found early with AJCC T1 cases, or monitored and found to have small recurrences. In summary, part one covered the basics of why and how we can use photography to examine, diagnose, and follow patients' tumors for growth or post-treatment regression. We learned that pigment, specifically the retinal pigment epithelium, plays a critical role in allowing us to view retinal pathology, specifically intraretinal microangiopathy. We saw that ARPE, or Acquired Retinal Pigment Epithelial Hypertrophy, and CHIRPI, or Congenital Hypertrophy of the Retinal Pigment Epithelium, Adenoma, and Melanocytoma are examples of how pigment can block fluorescence. Then we examined endophytic retinoblastoma to show a tumor unaffected by the overlying RPE can demonstrate a double circulation. I invite you to view part two of this series. Since 1998, the Eye Cancer Foundation has supported research and education in ophthalmic oncology. This can only be accomplished with your support. Please consider joining us in support of multi-center international cooperation, 
and to provide eye cancer specialists for unserved countries in order to decrease the 70% worldwide mortality due to retinoblastoma. Thank you for your attention. I invite you to view part two of this series on choroidal nevus, choroidal melanoma, and choroidal hemorrhage. Also visit us at the Eye Cancer Foundation, https colon forward slash forward slash eyecancercure.com forward slash donate. Thank you.